So I, I just wanted to say thank you, um, and without wasting too much time, because I know the 15-minute framework is um, very um, strict, I will get right to it. So I begin my talk today on a seemingly lighthearted note with a caricature of the scientist Jagadish Chandra Bose done by Gogonendranath Tagore in 1921. Bose, who pioneered the investigation of radio waves and experiments in plant science, is particularly remembered for his experiments that proved um, that both organic and inorganic matter ex respond to external stimuli. Titled Inanimate Scream, the caricature allows for access into a realm between human and non-human worlds, intimately tying both worlds with the nation making in the early 20th century. The caricature, which is not as lighthearted as it seems, I hope will, sh uh, will show um, that it opens up, opens up questions around the many levels of co-option between art, science, and political ideology in a particular early 20th century context. So the central figure in this drawing is seated in the mountains, elevated and held up by the range of cliffs around him. He sports an obvious third eye on, on his forehead, and from his hand, a spark-like inverted thunderbolt resonates tiny waves across the landscape. Two skinny plants that you can see over there um, are shout, shout um, first, first strike with a speech bubble that in Bengali says chada, which is a, a monetary subscription for a cause. In the foreground, smaller plants writhe and move. And you, as you can see, there's a mighty lotus. The mighty lotus there says Vande Mataram. And um, next to it, on the far right, the mimosa plant, also known in Bengali as the Lajjapati Lota, the shy plant, twists away from itself to a chant of shame, shame. And then beside it, the desmodium, which is also known as the telegraph plant, dances to a call to agitate. So in an inanimate scream, Gogonendranath's image of Bose seated in the mountains with a third seeing eye conflates him with the Hindu deity Shiva in the Kailash mountain range. He was, as you know, a continuation of the Vedic deity Indra, who is associated with lightning and thunder, which here becomes a link to Bose's researches and inventions in electricity. While Shiva's third eye and trident stand in for the forces of creation and destruction, the waves emanating from Bose's trident stand, um, animate and hold the visual plane together with a kind of eerie electromagnetic energy. So, Gaganendana takes a dig at the godlike capacities of the scientists, but most importantly makes obvious the connection with the, way, with the ways in which Bose conflated modern science and ancient Hindu thought. Gaganendranath's attention to detail also signals his interest in Bose's research. So while the lotus activates a reference to Indian myth and culture, the desmodium in mimosa plants comes straight out of Bose's biophysics experiments. The, Dispo the Dismodium gyrans has a trifoliate leaf whose two small lateral leaflets make spontaneous gyrations of a regular period, causing the plant to dance when ex presented with external stimulus, and also spontaneously due to turgor increase and decrease in its own cells. Another plant capable of rapid, rapid movement, the Mimosa pudica, responds to touch, sudden touch temperature change, the start or end of a constant current and induction shock. Having performed various experiments with the Desmodium and Mimosa to record plant movement and physiological changes, Bose's main conclusions were that plants have a well-defined nervous system, receptors for stimuli, conductors which electrically code and propagate the stimulus, and effectors or terminal motor organs. So what is the context to this caricature and why is it relevant to us today? So Gaganendranath, who is perhaps familiar to most of you here, was born into the illustrious and elite Tagore family in Calcutta in 1867. Bose was a close friend of Rabindranath's and a part of the elite and international Bengali circles of the Tagore household. The intellectual elite behind the processes of Indian modernism were caught between embodying the very fruits of colonial education, knowledge systems, and fiscal relationships based on land revenue that profited the landed gentry on the one hand and the burgeoning struggle for India's independence and independent identity on the other. So my 15-minute frame doesn't quite allow me to go into a great deal of detail about how the production of nature in the paradox that was Shantiniketan, a utopic experiment caught up in its own feudal, colonial, and racial hierarchical structures, is tied up with the villages that tried to reform the indigenous Shantali community or Shantiniketan's inner other.
I have shown elsewhere that the dialogues and processes between the institution and the Sartals formed a complex history that depended on greening narratives around salvage and sustainability, which uh, we, we can talk about it more um, in the discussion. Um, however, it may be useful to start on the premise that in the shifting political climate of the early 20th century, of early 20th century Bengal, capitalist extraction, land reform, modern anthropology, as well as a new romantic nationalism. Um, so Tagore's Arden agriculture experiment was contingent on and in conversation with these things. So what then were its implications at the interstices of colonial and zamindari power? So, with the constant presence of the British art teacher and reformer Ernest Bin Binfield Havel, Margaret Noble, um, or Sister Nivedita, who was a disciple of Swami Vivekananda, the Japanese scholar Kazuko Okakura, um, the art historian film, the Kumar Swami, among others, the cultural nationalism that emerged in these circles has been written about in great detail by art historians such as Partha Mitter and Tapati Gautakurta. The Orientalist narrative that amalgamated about around these circles invoked the idea of the great Indian synthesis and tried to collapse and encapsulate all phrases of Indian art history within a pristine core of a Vedic Hindu civilization. The term Indian and Indian art, therefore, came to stand for a Hindu, more specifically idealized Vedic civilization. In this talk, I briefly show how these debates around nationalism and Indianness were intimately tied to the politics of both colonial art and science. So Bose, who was educated at um, St. Xavier's College in Calcutta, uh, Cambridge and the University of London, was appointed to the Royal and Linnean Societies. His researches in microwave physics were readily accepted and used by his European contemporaries, yet his plant researches were met with hostility by Victorian mechanistic materialist philosophy of science. The prominent electrophysiologists at the time were reluctant to accept Bose's conclusions that all plants possess a form of intelligence and a capacity for remembering and learning. Bose's ideas did, however, draw neo-vitalists who saw the future of biology in metaphysics, such as the French philosopher Henri Bergson, the biologist and urban planner Patrick Geddes. European scientific circles at the time saw a split between the, me uh, the mechanistic materialist approaches and non-mechanistic ones. The vitalists, broadly defined, advocated for organ organic wholes, seeing an isomorphism between physical, psychological, and civilizational orders. So it would make sense that they too were drawn to the East in various ways. Bose credited Tagore for, and I quote, a wider and more sympathetic view of the continuity of life and its diverse manifestations, end quote. Arguing that all matter had lifelike properties, Bose claimed that, and I quote again, at the source of both the inner and outer lives is the same Mahashakti who powers the living and the non-living, the atom and the universe, end quote. The epitaph to Bose's first scientific monograph Response in the Living and Non-Living from 1902, which was also edited by Sister Nivedita, reads, the real is one, wise men call it variously. Quoting a well-known declaration from the Rig Veda made Bose's position clear. It publicly corroborated his belief that as proposed by the Vedas, the animate and the inanimate world was one, and that his electrographic discoveries served to scientifically prove it. Sister Nivedita's search for, the evidence, for evidence of India's greatness in Vedic Hinduism led her directly to the concept of vitalistic organic monism in Bose's work. So Bose's scientific stance was therefore soon to become a political one. Legitimizing science not simply as a knowledge system created and ratified only by the West, but a discipline perfectly compatible with and perhaps bound to Eastern philosophy, his work set into motion a new kind of nationalism embraced and disseminated by political figures such as Rabindranath and Vivekananda. Vivekananda, who preached the superiority of Vedic spiritual thought, saw Bose as the embodiment of a new India, in which the worlds of contemporary physical research was one with ancient spiritual thought. Not only did the Hindu nationalists co-opt Bose, he too, it seems to a large extent, co-opted them. Bolstering a reform-oriented Hindu nationalism that, while largely tolerant, imagined India primarily as a Hindu nation and did not account for the rich complexity of religious groups in India of the time. 
For example, in 1906, Ramananda Chatterjee of the Modern Review described Bose's plant response as the greatest work of Swadeshi, surpassing the burning of foreign clothes and the establishment of national universities. So the late 19th and early 20th century, as Gan Prakash writes, witnessed an explosion of pamphleteering and organizational activity that assumed and deployed science's authority to achieve a syntactical rearrangement of religion. It is in this broader spirit of reorganization that an experimental, at times playful space becomes available for this specific network of intellectuals to reconstitute the traditional, the modern, with the natural and vital. Bose's discoveries provided an obvious and easy link to the sciences until then seen by Europe as a domain of superiority named and owned by Europeans. Gaganendranath's caricature of Bose becomes a site in which co-option of many kinds, the Bengali intellectual's interest and emphasis on Western education, Bose's co-option of the Vedas and the Hindu metaphysicists' co-option of Bose among others is turned into a comic performance and yet seriously and thoughtfully examined. In addition to socio-political metaphor, Gaganendranath's portrayal of plant research question, raises the question of the significance of plants and plant science to the changing ideas of nature in the early 20th century. Bose's involvement in Rabindranath's pedagogical experiment fed into, the larger, into a larger discourse, a new Indian nature, invested in rural uplift and inspired by European neo-romantic ideas of the pre-Hindu, pre-industrial Hindu village. Rabindranath's interest in village reform was in sync with Bankim Chandra Chattopadhyay's 1872 essay that chastised the urban Bengali elite for not, for not appreciating the nation at, at its truest form, which was largely comprised of village communities. Bunkim's view of Britain pouring money into the city and wringing the village dry of resources, silk, rice, cotton, indigo, and so on, jute, matched contemporary agricultural statistics. And the views of uh, Indian economists such as Dadabai Naroji and Ramesh Dutt, whose drain theories used exhaustion as a means to characterize processes of natural resource exploitation. And the drain of natural wealth was portrayed in vitalist terms as the kind of extraction of living energy from the Indian nation body. So this particular moment between art, science, and political ideology that I've chosen to highlight today is an example of the messy and complex ways in which ideas around nature are co-opted, refurbished, and uh, directed in different directions. It brings to light a collision of often well-intentioned intellectual directions and calls for action that come together around the question of human and non-human life, both of which are inherently rendered political. Using a 20th century instance that shows how art and science participates in this nexus, I am trying to get to the dangers of what the arts and humanities can blur or erase in terms of intersectionality. While I don't suggest a scale, that a scaling up of this case study makes sense in the 21st century context, it is the messy embeddedness in colonial, capitalist, neo-romantic, and national narratives that serves as an astute reminder to the deep entanglements in our present with political, neoliberal, and extractive structures, both at the local and global level. It forces us to re-examine the ways in which we analyze and extrapolate from processes around nature, which we by now accept as a construct. So the environment is best understood as a condition of being with, so human beings um, as continuous with plants, animals, technology as well as politics, what is the role of the arts and humanities in the current mess we're in? How far is it possible to work with and against our embeddedness in neoliberal processes? If nothing, perhaps simply acknowledging the inevitability of our entanglements with the dangers of greenwashing and co-optive strategies might lend us a degree of humility with which to approach our academic and artistic projects. Thank you. Okay, questions. Let me start with a question that will break the ice. Uh, uh, sure, you know, the, your paper raises a very profound question for me, and that is that <clears throat> starting with Bose and, and then uh, the uh, other features that you mentioned of other artists, there is a uh, tendency to think that in many parts of the world, the East, as you said, <clears throat> there just is uh, an understanding of, of nature and a general metaphysics which is vitalist, and uh, that just disappeared 
in, in the West at some point. <clears throat> and I'm wondering to what extent the points you want to make, especially since you brought in art and, and humanities later, how important is it for you to, say, join Bruno Latour and, and Jane Bennett and so on in this vitalist idea of nature making demands on us in, in some literal sense? Uh, uh, so the, the scream expresses a sentience, which expresses a demand in the way that pain could, and, and so on. So, but I'm just wondering, instead of getting into this cultural relativist divide that the West doesn't, the West thinks that vitalism would, would fall afoul of the laws of conservation of energy and so on, and the East doesn't come with those assumptions about nature. And <clears throat> instead of getting into a cultural relativist divide, might you use your own uh, very insightful way of bringing in art, literature, humanities at the end, to say the following. Suppose we were even to say that we are not vitalists. Sorry, suppose we were even to say that we are not vitalists and that it is a metaphor to say that a plant makes a demand on us. It, it's not a demand in the way that you and I make demands on each other. It's a metaphor to say that a plant makes a demand on us. But, so here's the punchline. It is everybody Every saying says that a metaphor, or indeed a painting, which can function as a metaphor. Sorry, okay. No, no I'll hold the mic. Uh, so every sane view of metaphor, indeed of art generally, is that uh, it's irreducible to a literal paraphrasal. That there's something about a metaphor that you just can't paraphrase away in literal statements, right? Uh, it's just the nature of metaphor that something will, will be left behind in a literal paraphrasal of it. That's what makes it a metaphor. Okay, if that is true, then it follows from that. That can't be just a thesis about language. It's a thesis also about the world which is that if metaphors can't be paraphrased away, then, then there is a fragment of the world, or aspect of the world, that can't be captured by anything but that metaphor. That metaphor, or that painting, right? Nothing else will capture it. And if that is so, there's no reason to insist on being a vitalist. Art and so on can function just as well. Right? So you don't have to go Bruno Latour's way and get into a big fight with you know, Western science and so on. You can appeal to what you were, I think, grappling to say at the end, but when you brought in literature. It's just a thought. Should I answer yeah. that? Yeah. No, absolutely. I think what I was trying to do was actually show, through uh, Gogonindranath's caricature, show the networks of connections that were in place at the time and so sort of what was happening with Bose and so Sister Nivedita and also sort of Bose in Europe and so on. Um, but absolutely, I think, um, so the, I think there were two different things happening in the talk. One is what, what was happening in the early 20th century yeah. networks yeah. of art and science and then one right. is what we're trying to do with it now and, and absolutely. Right. Uh, so what I'm saying is that it's, you, there are different angles. In yeah. art history, you could certainly say the perspective of of somebody like Bose will generate a certain kind. But I'm saying philosophically, you can step back yeah. and not get into the relativist thing about the West versus, uh, and so on, yeah. Uh, yeah. of Swadeshi movement. Uh, it's not just Bose, this Bose, but there were several characters at that time. And uh, that is uh, Saha, uh, the other Bose, uh, Raman, all coincidentally in, in Bengal at the time. But um, I, I think that 
the fact that we were a very sophisticated, uh, for the times, uh, scientific entity uh, was a very important uh, expression uh, that the Indian public was making, that we were not some kind of a you know, antediluvian society that was asking for independence, but we were a sophisticated nation uh, with its complement of artists and poets and scientists uh, that really needed it. So, I, you know, I think it's extremely important, all, you know, that um, the, you know, that I, I, I don't know the literary allusion you made to that uh, this was more important than the burning of, uh, of uh, you know, imported clothes, but in a sense it was. Yeah. It really was, and not just this, but all the other uh, attempts of Indian scientists to show that they were on par with the rest of the world. I just thought I'd make that. Yeah. Yes? Uh, I really enjoyed my career. I just felt that uh, perhaps this is implicit in what you say, but needs to be made more explicit is the production of ancient Hinduism. Because you speak of that co-option, that articulation. We know today that Swami Vivekananda practically invented what we call yoga, for example. So I, I, I would have liked you to be more explicit about how the trope of ancient Hindu thought was actually produced within this milieu as much serving certain interests of that time. Just a comment. Yeah. Maybe. In addition to that, like, uh, uh, I was just thinking because, uh, and you have to see that Tagore has started that experiment with Shantini Ketan where he was trying to kind of go with nature, also incorporating Western ideas and thoughts. At the same time, as Shiva is saying, where Hinduism was playing a role, there is also the Brahmas that who are creating a certain kind of parallel thought that who produced a lot of kind of culture, there, there were a lot of cultural productions and then if you look at like the Rabindranath is also, was also Brahma and then if you look at, uh, apart from the names you mentioned, like uh, these guys were constantly in interaction about that uh, religious thoughts and all these. Also Upendra Kishar, Sutuitra's grandfather, and there were lots of popular uh, science writing and drawings, if you look at those things, and including Shukumar Rai. So the, I, I was just wondering, like, it's not only about that particular time of the scientific uh, community and intellectuals, it's also the kind of religious thoughts and their interactions were producing that kind of things, which I, I don't know why, what it happened later on that it didn't work out that way. No, no, exactly. Um, I think if I had more time, I would sort of uh, keep talking about these things. But that's what I was trying to show, in a sense, that how these scientific and religious uh, ideas are not just coming together, but speaking to each other and then sort of taking from each other, and uh, and how also the sort of intellectual artistic circles are integrated into into these things but in but in a sense the the larger idea of it is is the production of nature and how um, Indian nature becomes a particular thing which is also related to what Indian science is and what Indian art is but again within this sort of larger Hindu um, Vedic which it comes from the Brahmas especially um, core Yeah. Okay, so we're actually on time. That's great. Um, thank you. Um, uh, what is the next? Who's the next? You're next. No. No. Um, Aruna. Aruna Chandrasekhar is next. Can you hear me fine in the back? So. Um, extremely good morning to everybody. Um, they call me Foreign Dati or Foreign Funded Arundati. Uh, 
Yes, I'm Aruna Chandushekar. Um, I'm a journalist, a researcher, an activist, a stand-up comic, and uh, anything else that will, so, I mean, enable me to do anti-fossil fuel journalism in times like these. Um, because, um, so, uh, I've spent the last six or seven years uh, of my life um, staring literally into the void the open voids of central India to be specific. Um, I've looked at over 60 coal mines in the last six years. Um, not out of any uh, particular fascination for um, our own Desi versions of Vanta Black um, that don't involve Anish Kapoor and I'm not uh, falling into nothingness, but out of an inquiry um, to look deeper um, into my own history of privilege of consumption and to get to the heart of where we stand um, both in India as well as globally um, in terms of the resources we consume, the heart of our energy question um, and also our history of environmental racism. Um, but most importantly, how do we value resources as well as nature? Um, but for too long, we've been stuck at really based debates, um, and northern anthropocentric value systems have continued to persist in India, however. but development, but environment. Um, we're stuck at extremely rudimentary discussions still, and this is 2018. Um, and with those who value the non-human constantly being uh, labeled as anti-science and anti-national, but meanwhile, looking at other philosophical debates, meanwhile in SOAS and Leeds and international universities where uh, people are having debates, again, like people who've, uh, propo like there is, there is a perception, of course, of there was deep ecology, which said that all life forms have um, a right to exist, um, which is also which is the foundations of biocentricism, but at the same time that received a lot of critique from, uh, critique from ecofeminists, um, also from social ecologists who were like, okay, that is also kind of exclusionist. Uh, who, and because even now uh, there are debates and I'm looking at papers where um, it suggested that what right does a human being have to exist um, versus the smallpox virus. Um, so they need to be equated on the same plane. Why are certain species, because they're cuddly and furry, um, given uh, much more uh, greater, or why do we place much greater value upon certain species and not others? So these have also been debunked because um, in terms of, yes, are you going to value a blue whale or an endangered species differently uh, from a human being? Um, so these have been, Meanwhile, these are debates that um, have also expanded uh, our, uh, our debates around biocentrism and talking more from a sense of egalitarianism. Um, at the same time, while we're still stuck at the development and environment um, uh, debates on whether it's the print and Shekhar Gupta advocating and writing about uh, Sterlite and our need for copper soon after uh, a massacre that killed 10 people. Um, on the global stage, uh, especially at international climate negotiations, we've, the Paris Agreement marked a landmark uh, uh, sense of agreement across uh, over 169 nations including Syria um, and other nations that, that joined in last year, um, leaving the United States and um, Trump's extremely famous withdrawal technique and threat to withdraw um, in isolation. But at the same time, while it's almost universal, the fact that, yes, we are on a precipice, we have beyond a particular threshold, uh, the commitment was to keep warming under two degrees. Um, and that has kind of become how we value uh, large parts of nature. Um, so reducing it to a couple of degrees, reducing it in what we need to do to be able to keep that particular target uh, in place. But at the same time, we seem to be stuck at another stalemate, which is the fact of, of course, uh, yesterday Akhil was also talking about liberalism and so on, but like, 
the other thing that needs to that that's these are the, the key debates are also in terms of looking at um, stratification and history, uh, which is again the northern countries. You're looking at uh, historical targets, historical emissions. Looking at the fact that the Kyoto Protocol, the only legally binding uh, climate change uh, agreement, the Paris Agreement, is not yet. Those are debates that are still going on in terms of is it legally binding? Is it non-legally binding? People are already using it in courts, uh, but it's not something that. Uh, everybody is on the same page about. But the Kyoto Protocol essentially looks at historical emissions and saying that, look, you've had uh, centuries to, to emit, to pollute. Um, and where is our payment? Where is compensation? Where is loss and damage? And why should developing countries be made to foot the burden of this? So this back and forth has essentially become a question of finance, and that is where we are valuing nature, uh, with developing countries refusing to go forward unless there is finance, and rich countries refusing to pay. And this includes the EU as well, um, as well as the US, as well as Australia and Japan, uh, the big emitting nations, and um, saying that, look, can we start their demanding a clean slate, saying, yes, Paris, historic, uh, je t'aime, so on and so forth. Can we start with a clean slate from 2020 when it kicks into action? But ignoring everything else that has happened in the past. Uh, and at the same time, with rich nations refusing to pay, yes, there are uh, Every time there is a large optical uh, illusion of, of some form of agreement or some form of climate action, there is maybe a $2 million uh, dollar, uh, pledge to an adaptation fund by a rich country. But essentially, rich countries are not moving towards uh, these particular payments. Uh, so essentially, we are also seeing the rise of protectionist governments in the West as well as in developing countries as climate migration increases, um, as countries are becoming much more nationalist, as borders uh, and nationalism and debates around it uh, continuing, uh, are continuing to fuel this. And like with uh, Donald Trump essentially saying, I, I fight for the people of Pittsburgh and not Paris, right? Uh, which makes no sense. Uh, the, the people of Pittsburgh themselves and their mayors um, are arguing for decentralization at the same point of time. Um, so while these debates are particularly ongoing, we have, if, if you're going to look at, um, even in climate negotiations, what becomes far more important is semantics. Like last year at the COP23 negotiations, it was almost like as if vulnerable uh, millions in developing countries were screwed out of, let's say, damage for climate impacts. Like for instance, what has happened in Kerala because of the placement of a comma or a typo. So semantics seems to dictate and plays such a large role in how uh, these negotiations take place internationally. But um, at the same time, with an eye on temperature rise, financial valuations and instruments of every size are attempting to assess varying degrees of common loss and ways to sequester uh, but the evidence of actual trickle down is hard to come by. For instance, climate insurance um, and private sector participation in it is now amongst the biggest debates. But we are not um, seeing investment when it comes to R&D and tech in other parts of the world. Um, there is a lot more money for consultants commissioned by rich nations to come to poor nations to give you uh, maybe a vulnerability assessment for an extremely large fee and leave. Um, so it ensures that money is also kept in the West. But how nature and non-human is valued in the developing world, particularly in India, where we're well into our third decade of economic liberalization, we're just getting used to Swiggy, um, we're just getting used to, um, yeah, to ordering everything that we want to online. But then at the same time, like, and right now, it, this is what will matter most, because we are set to overtake China in terms of our population. We have already uh, the world's second largest producer of coal, um, as well as consumer. Um, 
also topping emissions charts in the top three. Um, so now, and we have also the other paradox of having a population that's most at risk from climate impacts, right? So environmentalists have also become Meanwhile, we have a corporate communications uh, wing that masquerades as a government. Um, so at the same time, what has happened is that we have environmentalists who've also become mired in the same alphabet um, that this COPCOM wing has come up with, which is essentially the vocabulary of SEZ, PPP, uh, NPV, net present value of our forests, um, and that it, this seems to be lost and we seem to be losing our connect uh, with non-environmentalists, uh, losing our connect with lay people um, who seem to again uh, be pushed and the, the development environment debate continues to be pushed on to them. Um, but at the same time, like back to these places where these gigantic voids of central India, where map and memory um, seem to be fading. We are literally redefining borders. I have seen villages disappear in a year. Um, large tracts of land disappear into the void. Um, and at the same time, how do we value uh, nature? For instance, uh, how do we define a forest? That has been one of the longest uh, running Supreme Court cases. Uh, a gentleman named Godavarman, bless his soul, um, was part of uh, our long standing debate on how we define forests. As of right now, Lodi Gardens. Um, has the same value where, where I mean, you, Modi is doing possibly pranayama in the morning is valued at the same or on the same scale as Central Indian forests. Uh, you're valuing a eucalyptus plantation um, with the same uh, lens as you would the Western Ghats, right? And we still do not have any ideas of what is inviolate. We have no inviolate forest policy. We assume that eucalyptus and acacia plantations can make up for the loss of forest in Arunachal. Um, and our valuation of biodiversity, let's not even go there. Like the criteria for which we we have set up in violet areas, never mind that that draft of that policy has never been issued, um, has excluded um, its bio, has excluded biodiversity as well as in terms of hydrology. So yeah, no wonder we have a water crisis that's knocking at our doors. Meanwhile, front, frontline resistance communities, we are talking about the same communities that Modi mentions when he goes to uh, uh, Davos and says things like, uh, look at our footprint, uh, but our per capita footprint is so low. This is what we also mention. And we continue to shoot from the shoulders of the poor, saying that, yes, uh, look at their consumption, right? Um, it, it is so incredibly low. But these frontline communities who are looking at displacement, um, 24 million people displaced by development projects. That is the population of Australia since independence to the year 2000. Have we apologized? No, there is no Holocaust memorial for them. Um, excuse me, maybe, I, but, but this is like, um, this has been, we do not look at environmental racism. We do not look at uh, mass killings which have taken place in these, whether it's Bastar or otherwise. Um, we continue to be diluting the only safeguards around consultation and consent. Uh, this is a perpetuation of environmental racism. We continue to have that. Uh, we don't have air quality, we're not. How do we value pollution? There aren't air pollution monitors in the states of Chhattisgarh and Orissa, maybe there's one. Um, which in which they're broadcasting lifetime air pollution data. So essentially, communities have also been pushed to the brink, right? And this is not just, yesterday we were talking about indigenous communities. Um, it's easy to, for me, going to mining communities, uh, it's not the same as a very simple, linear, jal jungle, jameen, indigenous people will always fight for nature. If you've decimated nature, um, if you've decimated uh, agriculture, there is no water in these areas. Uh, the only option for you is to work for a coal mining company. You haven't been compensated for 20 to 30 years and your land has been acquired in the national interest. You can issue three notifications in a gazette without a word and have, you see billboards that are for, by the Ministry of Coal 
saying you have eminent domain in 2018, right? Um, you cannot question, you cannot object to the acquisition of your land, you can only say that this is the wrong piece. I think you might have made a mistake in your survey. And now, since there have been dilutions of consent and so on, uh, there have been dilutions of consent, people are actually blocking production. People are, uh, there are self-governance movements such as Pathalgadi, where you put the constitution outside or, there is, or, or on a stone or on a menhir and say that we have the right to govern ourselves. And now in the digital age, they're also, we are also seeing though more indigenous voices coming into the media because and breaking those bastions of privilege as well as information. But I would like to also end on this note, which is also hopeful. There is a lot for us to learn from frontline communities who are facing massive uh, militarization as well as conflict. Um, but I do believe that there is a future, and the future is, is radical. It is anti-national, uh, as impacts are felt across, um, as borders make little or no sense. And it is local and decentralized as governments, whether it's the city of New York divesting from fossil fuels, whether it is Kerala in times of disaster and floods, um, and um, it, it is resilient. Um, and at the same time, um, so yeah, hopefully into that anti-national, decentralized, anti-caste, um, anti-racist, and with women uh, and sexual minorities reading from all anchors, let us hope to keep hell at bay. Thank you. Um, questions? Yes. Should the idea of indigenous itself change? What constitutes the indigenous? Because I'm asking this question because I'm, it's in my own work quite a, quite a big question. Um, I work on, I'm an art historian, so I work on a Pradhan Gon painting. And the word indigenous has become a very complex and fluid thing in the art world in art history and in the art market, which is challenging me to think about the other things that I work on, which are public parks, with, like Lodi Gardens, and what claims people make in the name of being, we're from this place, which has a park, and that park is being taken away from us. And we watered those plants when they were first put here. So there's a kind of um, affiliation between the indigenous person who's fighting, I think possible, I'm not sure, possible for the person who's fighting for the land to not be raised for an iron mine like where I have worked, which is near Humpy, or the person who is looking park that they saw it being planted, they watered it because there weren't pipelines, and now those trees are being felled to accommodate some new, much larger idea of what a smart city might be like, right? So I'm wondering how we bring these worlds, these conversations into contact with each other. One point I'm thinking about is, can we rethink this word indigenous? What, it, what we deposit into that word? Right. Um, just with a caveat, like um, in India, we don't say indigenous because uh, the BJP and the RSS have contested this for the long time because all Hindus are indigenous, um, right? So which is why we use Adivasi, which is again a Sanskritized word. It doesn't necessarily. So the, the arguments around indigenous have been raging for a long time of, in terms of where does our definition particularly come from? Uh, who is indigenous? Now you have the Patidar as well as Patels and others asking for in looking in terms of um, uh, what that definition is. But at the same time, you have so many tribes who have been left out of getting a scheduled tribe status just because there's a spelling mistake, right? So I think it's a lot more fraught uh, in terms of looking at India specifically. Um, 
At the same time, if you look at um, going by definitions of indigenous groups internationally, Dalits are as well you are indigenous, right? So we also, uh, Dalit groups, it's not just a very, this is scheduled caste, scheduled tribe. Um, so I think those definitions, and I think it's, it's something that we need to have a better understanding of. But then, of course, if you're talking about whether it's a public park or a utility or, or something else, but then how do we have, um, like, it's, it's like, for instance, uh, a community near coal miners that I that work with, they're like, why can't we have equity? Right? Why don't we have equity? Why can't we bid? Why is it an a, a Dani or a Jindal that gets to build something or do that park or execute a transportation contract or do a forestation contract? Give those contracts to us. We'll do it. We know far more about foresting or in terms of give those contracts to us, so, which is, of course, like when it comes to a park, um, I'm sure that those uh, uh, I mean, like, it might have different repercussions, but then in terms of management, uh, in terms of representations, why are they never, like, also the jobs that they get are essentially going to be unskilled. But do you have an indigenous person who is maybe on the board of that particular park, or seeing how it integrates, or what are the kinds of activities as well, are they in resonance and consonance with what uh, the community around there is? I think those could be questions. Aruna, can I ask you, um, your, your subject was the non-human, and the non-human is a very capacious category. And um, there's, of course, been a great tendency to focus, when we talk of the uh, environment, on the biosphere as the non-human. Um, and I'm, but but clearly, non-human is wider than that, and especially urgently wider than that because we've gone from, from uh, uh, this, uh, biosystems to geosystems and so on. So we've gone to things over and above life uh, properties. So I'm wondering if, if it's as capacious as that and we are seeking a kind of conservationist outlook or mentality on it, what if we adopted the following extremely general principle of the highest generality, uh, which is something like this. If, if anything exists, anything, even some little humble thing like this, just this, right? anything exists, don't get rid of it unless it's doing harm. As a basic principle of ethics, politics, political economy, and of course metaphysics, right, because it's about things. So, so it's extremely simple, it's extremely general. If anything exists and it's not doing harm, don't get rid of it. Let it be. Right. Uh, so, I mean, I'm just coming from your idea of non-human. Right. Right? So let it be anything. It's just a metaphysical principle tied to ethics, politics, and political economy. If it isn't doing harm, I, the right to exist is, and that's also kind of whether, okay, going back to maybe the biosphere, that's also something that a lot of, that is the cutting edge of animal rights um, arguments right now at this point. Um, and like also, um, if you're talking about, I'm all for a commons, a, a commons agenda over any kind of communal agenda, but like, and so which is of course how we value the commons, um, and again, not just biosphere, um, we're talking atmosphere, we're talking um, everything that, that exists in the commons, and as long as it, it's not um, doing harm, um, the right to exist, and that yeah. sounds like a pretty reasonable argument to me. Right, but you see, I'm not asking this from some idle, uh, metaphysical thing. I, I'm saying it may be the only way to fight the culture of obsolescence. Right. right? I mean, the whole, the idea is, the prevalent idea is, if, if something with more can do something better, go for it and get rid of what exists. I'm saying no. You make the default the opposite. Right. Right? So you don't have a culture of obsolescence. This will, this will be no good in four years. In four years, the Goethe Institute will have to get something else. Right. Right? Which does all sorts of... I'm saying, 
that culture of obsolescence, may, maybe there's no other way to fight it but to take the view that if it, the opposite default outlook, which is if anything exists and it's not doing harm, let it, let it be. Right. I think maybe also some of that in terms of how we interpret barren lands or wastelands, um, of course, and how there is a wasteland atlas, T.S. Eliot would appreciate this, but um, in his grave. But um, see how we don't, uh, that these are, it's again how we attach value and who attaches value, right? And who attaches whether something is harmful or not. And from those particular sure. perspectives, it's, it's extremely essential no, in that case for us to, to figure out um, who's doing the valuing and what no, no, are things of value. Uh, yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, and which is why what you propose is, um, could be something worth propagating. Yeah. yeah, sorry, I just wanted to, but I mean, what harm is, is also sort of uh, difficult to define because what, for example, your example of the wild animal attacking the cattle, it's harming the cattle, but at the same time, you know, sort of there are degrees of harm as well. Or, and for example, if you leave this be, it turns into waste that is probably is sort of problematic because it's battery waste. So, so there's, a, there's a kind of, uh, yeah. again, this value question. I no, I completely, harm itself. I completely agree that there will, be dis there will be controversy about what is harm and what is not. But it, if somebody were to tell me that it is harmful for it to exist because something better has come along That's or is more efficient or something comes along, I'm just going to say, come off it. What the, what's, it, 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 it's absurd to say this is harmful because something is doing something um, more efficiently or whatever it is. It, it's just a, a non sequitur, a numbing non sequitur to say this is harmful. Right? But I agree with you that you have to figure out what harm is and, and there'll be discussions and controversies about that. Yeah. Right. How do you? Yeah. Basically, uh, you know, just uh, a commentary. I mean, I think as an investment banker, I've lived long enough and cynically enough to recognize saying that the relatively globally recognized language is economics, and that trumps everything and drives public policy and entire conversations on the ground. Uh, in that regard, uh, you know, this recent movement of ecological economics and environmental economics, uh, particularly the context in which it is being, uh, you know, used in India. I don't know whether you are aware, there was a recent Indian Institute of Forest Management Reserve uh, valuation which was put out on the, on, the, on the forest reserves. I think it valued paint at something like about 19,000 crores. Uh, the comment was, A, there is a danger at 19,000 crores. I mean, I don't know whether the ecologists really understand the truths of business and economics, the coal that's underlying at Pange or Kana is in multiples of 19,000 crores. It might end up as a Trojan horse arg argument by the environmentalists against themselves. So that's one commentary of, of, of uh, caution. Uh, the second uh, point which uh, uh, you know, uh, I, was, I was looking to make was uh, uh, with regard to uh, uh, what you mentioned about uh, on the ground with regard to projects being implemented, why is it that you know, uh, the local people are not taken on board or why they are not you know, involved in more skilled jobs, etc. Now, having been involved in these projects as a lender, as a developer at various uh, levels, uh, the practical issue is two or three things. The dynamics, the way they work, you might have a local chieftain, you bring him on board, he will say, you know, pay me a lakh or two lakhs a month, you know, I will take care of the rest. So it's all very well, you know, at an ideation level. Uh, afforestation is another aspect. Uh, it's not that there is no intent on the part of corporates to win. When you set up a project, you know, it's something that makes you feel good about yourself, saying that, you know, you don't want to be doing harm. And it's just a, you know, a rounding of fraction in your project cost. The point is, again, on the environmental side, there are no frameworks which, you know, enable you to do afforestation. There are no initiatives, let's say NGOs or, you know, credible NGOs which will take up an afforestation exercise. You give him the 10 crores or 20 crores or 30 crores or whatever it is. So there is no framework. Now, where does that begin to get addressed in this entire framework is what I wanted to ask. Right. Um, so to the first question, um, I'm really uh, glad. Um, and it, it, it's, it's also depressing, but then um, it was so depressing that um, I, I, I was in 
an extremely little state of depression, uh, thought about uh, ending my life until uh, renewable tariffs dropped. So there was an auction in which wind power prices fell to 2.44 and suddenly I could smile again because I was like, hey, economic imperative to do the right thing, right? Um, and of course now that there is also a tremendous amount of money uh, to be able to reinvest. Um, like for instance, let's say there is, a, there is something, I did a story called, um, for, every four, for every ton of coal, 400 tons goes to a clean energy cess, right? So that totaled up to 50,000, 57,000 crores as of last year. It was supposed to be reinvested in renewable R&D in terms of uh, remediating uh, project sites for pollution and toxics as well as looking in terms of, it also funds the Ministry of Environment and Forest. Last year, 57,000 crores was diverted to GST and making up for state losses. Parts of it were diverted towards Namami Ganga and Swachh Bharat. Again, uh, government of India, you're not valuing the Mahanadi where you're dumping this coal ash or whatever. There is money. Um, there is the lack, it seems to be, is of political will. There are so many financial instruments. CAMPA, huge fund. DMF, the District Mineral Foundation, huge fund. So there are slush funds, there's money to do it. There are also organizations, for instance, there are indigenous organizations such as LEAF um, in Bastar, conflict-ridden, they are helping miners in Karnataka restore ecological balance, plant endemic species. Um, I think it's a lot of it is a question of will. And yes, of course, the question of qualm, which came up, which is, again, societies that would not imagine or help but think collectively. Um, um, you have uh, divide and rule, which is quite basic, which is your land mafia, uh, your company agents, and so on, working on ground, distributing money, like, like public hearings and consultations become elections. Um, you don't allow videographers in. Um, so there are, I mean, for, for people to be able to set up, it's, if you were to take, your, your frontline communities are your first compliance and only independent compliance mechanisms. EIA, people who prepare reports, are hired again by companies themselves. I do, I, I don't want to, like if companies do want to do good, there's a huge ecosystem of people to be able to, to consult. I don't believe that there is a shortage of that. Um, it is a shortage of will. But we could have continued this discussion on the outside around Jai Sutta and uh, solidarity. Thank you.